Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Andreas, uh, for inviting me to present on your colloquium. It's been a long time that I've been in contact, contact with uh, Rachel Carlson Center. Uh, I wish I could be there. I wish I had come before and shared my research, but it's uh, better late than never. Um, so today is an opportunity for you to hear a little bit of what I've been doing uh, the last few years, my research, and I hope uh, we'll have an um, interesting and uh, insightful uh, Q&A after where we can also share more a uh, more direct conversation of, uh, around my research and your research that I want to hear about. So let me move to the talk. So a small trivia before I start is for you to tell me at the end of the presentation, uh, where is this uh, video from or with which I start. So my talk today focuses on three ideas born from my recent research. The first idea is that ideologies of limits and limitless growth are intertwined, perpetuating injustice in the name of progress. A second idea is that overdeveloped economies need to degrow if we are serious about global environmental justice. The third idea is that environmental and climate injustices are systemic features of capitalist growth. Now, by environmental justice, I mean a fair and equitable share of environmental goods and damages. Crucially, a fair share of the costs of climate change. That is climate justice. By overdeveloped economies, I mean those that have used more than their fair share of the planet. By degrowth, I refer to a socially sustainable reduction in the production and consumption of environmentally damaging goods. I will illustrate my ideas today with empirical examples from agrarian change and urbanization, water and land conflict, and food production and climate adaptation, as well as with data from my macro work on ecological economics. I will conclude drawing links between uh, my three arguments. So the first idea I want to talk about, limits and unlimited growth as two sides of the same coin. Uh, let me start uh, by a formative, for me, fieldwork experience. Mata de Pera is a small town a few kilometers north of our campus outside Barcelona. If you were to sit at the town square for a coffee, you would think you are in any other small Spanish village. Yet, this is the town with the highest income in all of Spain. Walk off the square and you will find yourself in a Spanish Beverly Hills. Villas with high walls, angry dogs, swimming pools, and ceaseless sprinklers. I was there back in 2010, fresh in Barcelona, working with a team of conservation scientists and historians, studying water conflict and land use during Spain's civil war and Franco's dictatorship. We searched city archives and we collected oral histories from elders. And we documented with GIS and satellite images the conversion of what was an agrarian landscape into a leafy suburb. You can see, you can't really see the suburb on the right picture, but the, the white dots you see are the villas like the one in the picture I showed before. So our starting research question is, how did this happen? And what was the role of water in this process of what we called urbanizing the countryside? Landed elites, we found, privatized water after the civil war, and by controlling water, they kicked peasants off common lands, parceling fields for real estate development. Franco's guns killed Republican and peasant alternatives and made possible an urbanization of the countryside that today seems natural, inevitable, and in some ways pastoral and peaceful. But here is how Madalena Font, a child at the time, a daughter of a peasant sharecropper, remembers the process. What struck me most uh, during our research, though, was how this violence and injustice were erased from collective memory, even the memory of the victims, by a hegemonic story of progress. Progress defined as victory in a war against scarcity. 
progress as synonymous to more and more water. Time and again, I found in the archives, elites sold the story of water being naturally limited, legit legitimating this way their projects of expansion while presenting themselves as saviors in a battle against a common enemy of scarcity. Yet Mata de Pera, with some 675 millimeters of rain each year, is not arid. Water, we argued in the paper, was scarce for real estate development, but this development was not natural nor necessary. It was a political and economic project. Elites told the story of natural limits, I came to realize, to justify their plans of unlimited urban growth. Since the 1970s, environmental debates are trapped in a supposed binary. Malthusians on the one hand, defending limits, against economists or eco-modernists defending growth. In my book, Limits, published last year by Stanford University Press, I argue instead that limits to growth and unlimited growth are two sides of the same coin. Like Mata de Pera, a specter of limits constantly justifies capitalism's otherwise senseless and unjust pursuit of unlimited growth. Consider the myth of scarcity, the central foundation of mainstream economics. Our wants, economists tell us, are theoretically limitless. Therefore, the world is by definition limited. Don't worry though, we can always allocate resources efficiently, grow the economy and satisfy more and more wants. And economists, of course, are the ones who are gonna tell us how to do that. Turning the history of economic thought upside down, I show in my book how a first defense of unlimited growth in the name of limits is found in Malthus's infamous essay on population. Malthus is supposedly a prophet of limits and overpopulation. Read the essay though, free of what you've heard, and you will be surprised. Malthus did not think that there are any limits to food, whose production, he wrote, may increase forever. I can't do a Malthus impersonation voice here, I'm sorry. No limits to commodities either. We can create them to as great quantities as we want, Malthus wrote. And a happy nation, for Malthus, is one whose population grows as close as possible to a geometric rate. That is Malthus, no? the prophet, the supposed prophet of overpopulation, wanting the population, if possible, to grow at the geometric rate. Economic models today assume that humans have unlimited wants, that we maximize consumption or utility in the disciplines jargon. Likewise, Malthus, the first professor of economics actually, assumed that our nature is to have children without limits, even if people around him, and for centuries, plant pretty well their families. Assuming, and that was the starting premise of his argument, that geometric population is growth is natural and desirable, Malthus constructed the fantasy world, I argue, of eternal scarcity. One where, as he wrote, there is not enough for everyone to have a decent share. The poor in this Malthus, Malthusian fantasy world are those who, by the nature of things, are left without a piece of the pie. Don't help them, Malthus warned. Only the fear of hunger pushes them to work hard and grow the pie for, for everyone. Increase the produce of the country, he wrote. Any other way of helping the poor will be cruel and tyrannical. Let me get some water from a huge water bottle here. Now, in the book, I argue that by turning capitalism's social production of scarcity into the natural state of things, economists ever since Malthus explain away the continuing presence of poverty amidst plenty. There is simply not enough, they tell us, not yet, not in Malthus' time, not in our times, two centuries after, and uh, with economists uh, several times bigger than they were at Malthus' time. 
In my book, I claim that paradoxically environmentalists emphasizing the limitness of Earth play the game of economists. If the world is limited, the natural response is what it has always been, escape and conquest, growth and colonization, geoengineering and landing in Mars. Think of the space pair theme that I used before, no? On the one hand, it was the moment that we supposedly realized that we live on one Earth, but symbolically, that was also the moment that we were escaping Earth and the moment that our fantasies of escaping Earth were at their most powerful. Only when we own the choice of limits, I argue in the book, and stop attributing limits to stingy nature and the limited Earth or our unquenchable selves, will we really start sharing and finally living and having enough. Indeed, for radical environmentalists, from the Romantic movement, the harshest critics of Malthus at his time, to the anarcho-feminists of Emma Goldman, that I have the picture here, to the 1970s Greens, or to the degrowth movement today, limits are not an undesirable external imposition. They are a moral and political project that goes hand in hand with equality and justice. I call this in my book, a project of collective self-limitation. Society structured on an instinct of limit, not unlimited expansion. If our needs, our consumption, our reproduction can be limited, then scarcity is a myth. Everyone can and must have a decent share because there is already enough. And it's interesting here to to contrast no? the cover of the magazine Emma Goldman was uh, publishing to common images that we have now to talk about nature, no? limited earth, a limited planet. Look how Emma Goldman was instead emphasizing abundance. Abundance through simplicity, abundance through sharing. In my book, I read classical Greece. I'm Greek, by the way. So, you know, as Greeks, we are all trained since we are little kids, to, to learn about our past and our mythology and not mythology of the past. I passed a big part of my childhood thinking I was Achilles. I didn't grow up to be that strong, unfortunately. I need to pick up again on my push-ups, maybe. Um, I've read a lot on, on Greece as, as a child, but I had never studied Greece seriously. And that, uh, that uh, book I wrote on limits was an opportunity because classical Greece, uh, I found out, is one of uh, the civilizations uh, that took limits and self-limitation very seriously. Ancient Greeks uh, were among the first to invent money and definitely the first to live through the disasters of compound debt. They developed in response a moral philosophy of limitedness. Democracy, tragedy, and their ethic of moderation were all institutions of self-limitation, a culture of limits we so badly lack in our era of runaway global warming. A combination like that, not only of the Greeks, but of course of many other civilizations and of many other groups who live today, a combination of sufficiency and egalitarian sharing is what I understand as the imaginary of the growth, living simply so that others may simply live. The roots of the tree of the, uh, these ideas, not only in the name of the growth, but affiliated ideas, extend to the economics of Gandhi and Kumarapa in India, Andean notions of Vivir, Eastern or African philosophies. I see the growth Therefore, as one among many keywords in a pluriverse of alternatives to a one-way future consisting only of growth. I'm passionate about the growth, but let me put my ecological economist hat. I don't wear hats anymore, but you can imagine me now putting my ecological economist hat and defending the growth with a less passionate language of numbers to avoid the charge of being a romantic and a utopian which I take as compliments, actually. So let me move to the second idea, where I'm going to use a little bit more of graphs and numbers of overdeveloped economies must grow. A recent study by my colleague and friend, uh, Jason Hinkel, finds that G8 nations are responsible for 85% of global CO2 emissions in excess of 350 ppm. 
Climatologists Alice Baus Larkin and Kevin Anderson calculate that high income nations must reduce their emissions 10% every year in line with the first share of a 2 degree Celsius carbon budget. And yet, these same economies aspire to grow 2 to 3% every year, doubling every 20 years or so, 10 times bigger by the end of the century, straight into a ridiculous infinity. What you see here is a graph of global GDP growing 3% each year. Compare 2018 to 2100. Compound growth is the madness of economic reason, David Harvey wrote. I couldn't agree more. Maybe green growth then, increasing GDP while reducing resources and emissions. In a review of recent resource models, we find with Jason Hickel that in all scenarios, global resource use increases alongside GDP till 2050, as it has actually done till now, as you see in this graph. IPCC's climate models square growth with 1.5 degrees Celsius climate change only by assuming unproven and untested technologies of negative emissions, bioenergy with carbon capture that will take carbon out of the atmosphere. These are the yellow and brown um, parts of the graphs you see here. Tellingly, the only IPCC model that doesn't do that involves fast energy degrowth, and that's the first uh, model you see, the, the um, P1. Some eco-modernists celebrate a supposed dematerialization of high-income countries, pointing to reductions in domestic resource use, the red lines in the graphs, alongside continued GDP growth, the blue lines. Yet this, we argue Jason Hickel, is an artifact of globalization. Look at material footprints, the green lines. That is the total resources used to produce the goods a country consumes, including imports. In a globalized economy, footprints are our best guide, and also global level data, like the previous graph. Both of these increase hand in hand with GDP. Gladly, 21 countries, including UK, US, or France, have reduced their carbon footprints between 2000 and 2015, even though their economies grew. But their reductions were close to 1% to 2% at best per year, nowhere near the necessary 10% year after year that, as we saw, is necessary. And mind you, all these economies saw low GDP growth, close to 1% average each year since 2000. This is precisely why we call this period one of a secular stagnation. If growth were closer to the desired 3%, there would hardly be any reduction of emissions. If the global economy recovers from COVID the way it did in 2008, then we will overshoot two degree paths within a decade. According to scenarios we constructed with Slammersack and O'Neill, even an ambitious global mitigation plan, what we call a Green Deal, uh, inspired by the U Europe's Green Deal, uh, the yellow line in our graph, fails to keep global emissions within two degrees uh, scenarios, the blue shaded area. The only recovery path that stays within the envelope of two degrees uh, paths is the green line in the graph, a scenario that combines fast decarbonization, like in the Green Deal, reduced energy use, and crucially, zero GDP growth in the global north. Now, you may rightly ask, and that's the same questions that we ask, uh, will lack of growth cause unemployment? How do we finance clean energy without growth? Will inequalities increase without growth? That's my research agenda on degrowth and on policies for degrowth. For example, with Nicholas Ashford from the MIT, we have showed how a reduction of working hours can indeed increase employment and leisure while reducing emissions. With Tillman Hartley and Jeroen van den Berg, my colleagues here in Barcelona, we assessed redistributive policies for increasing equality without growth. And there are many, 
from wealth taxes and maximum income limits to a universal basic income or making workers uh, shareholders of the companies they work for. The obstacle to the growth, of course, uh, is not policies. It's not that we lack the ideas. I mean, these are unorthodox ideas. They are ideas that few people research, but we are not lacking ideas. What we lack are um, plausible or possible politics. How do we get these things done? No, how, no matter how ecologically necessary the growth might be, politically, it seems impossible. And we are not utopian in that sense. In our recent book, The Case for the Growth, we particularly focus on that question. How could this happen? How could we move in a degrowth direction? We defend in the book a political strategy that articulates protest, conflict, reform, and prefiguration. We propose building new common senses, a concept we take from Antonio Gramsci, through cultural changes embodied and practiced in the making and in the defense through conflict of commons, articulated and generalized through political movements that promote such commons. With Viviana Sara, we studied exactly such transformative processes taking place in Barcelona. The city has a vibrant economy of commons where new senses of justice and sufficiency are practiced and diffused. The social movement of the city coming together in the occupied squares in 2011, organized into a political party. Barcelona and Comú has been governing the city since 2015 with a remarkable agenda of social and environmental justice, including opening up public spaces, giving spaces to cooperatives, supporting an alternative economy. And that's a picture from the publicity campaign of the party. And in many ways, I find it funny because it speaks so much to our research that I was wondering whether they read our research, which of course is not the case. It's more that we are part of a whole culture here in the city that thinks along the same ways. And the advertisement plays with the, with the word common, which is the name of the party, but also common sense. And it says that there is enough if we share what there is, and that this is a common sense which was very much the common sense that I was trying to promote with my limits book. Let me now move to my last thesis, that environmental injustices are systemic features of capitalism. I will start again with an image from fieldwork. The Seyhan River Plain in the southern coast of Turkey is a pastoral landscape for most of the year though. Walk there in late spring and you will see people as far as your eyes can see, cramped in makeshift tents next to streams, waiting in long lines to use rest restrooms. Working 10 hours a day for $1 an hour till the dead heat of the summer, seasonal migrants of Kurdish origin from the eastern depths of Turkey harvest watermelons, making barely enough money to pass the winter, winter with their families back home. My then student, Entebkan Turhan, traveled to Seyhan and talked to workers under the suspicious eye of the local police. We were studying programs of the UNDP and the Turkish government to help ostensibly seasonal workers adapt to climate change. Extreme heat events cause more heat strokes every year and diseases thrive in the makeshift settlements while droughts threaten agriculture in the region. Adaptation included a cemented settlement for pre-made tents where the um, seasonal workers could live, new bathrooms and a charity clinic where doctors checked workers daily for disease or heat stroke. Workers had also to register with IDs so that health authorities kept track of them. In our paper published at Global Environmental Change, we argued that this is not adaptation, but maladaptation. Adaptation that increases the vulnerability of vulnerable people. The Turkish government is acting biopolitically. We use there a term uh, by my, Michel Foucault. Its logic is one of controlling the circulation of people and commodities for the sake of capital and growth. Helping temporary farm workers adapt could be very easy, actually. Give them access to health, give them access to health and benefits available to normal workers. 
remove intermediaries and let workers unionize and get decent pay. Allow workers to settle if they want with their families in Seihan. None of this is allowed to happen. Because the goal, we argued in the paper, is not to help, but to keep a cheap, docile and mobile labor. Healthy, just enough to survive the heat and to work in the fields. Coming for the growing season and swiftly living after, without settling. Uninsured, paid below the minimum without complaining. And carefully monitored by the doctors too, in case there are any Kurdish agitators. The historical discrimination of ethnic Kurds meets here the logic of capital. Treating seasonal workers exceptionally maintains the prices of Turkey's watermelons low enough in order to be competitive in the cutthroat global market under conditions of climatic change. Capital is adapting to climate, we found. People not. Somewhat comparable is the situation in River Evrotas in southern Greece. We were there six years ago with Panagiota Kotsila, studying why malaria, eradicated in Greece in the 1970s, made a comeback. Austerity cuts in mosquito control and the hotter climate caused an explosion of new cases. The government, though, blamed the epidemic on seasonal workers from Pakistan, who are there to pick oranges. Our in-situ political ecology with Panagiota revealed how un underpaid seasonal workers who could not afford the exorbitant rents locals charged for a loom lived cramped with family in the marshes, in tents, where malaria mosquitoes thrived. Lack of access to hospitals and fear of deportation stopped workers from reporting symptoms. Seasonal workers remained invisible until malaria threatened Greece's tourism. Then the state, like in Turkey, targeted migrants biopolitically, othering them and framing the disease as an imported anomaly that should not worry tourists, while using the pretext of a health crisis to control the movements of workers even more tightly, making sure they pick oranges and then they go. This racialized othering that we observed in Greece like we observed it in Turkey, was not only a matter of nationalist, fascist, xenophobic, racist mindsets. It was functional, we argued, to capital accumulation and growth. Racism is what keeps the labor of an exploited other cheap. In my 2018 book, The Growth, I politicized what was otherwise an apolitical debate around limits to growth within ecological economics, at least. I showed how from its onset at the factories of Manchester and the plantations of the Americas, economic growth is predicated on the violent exploitation of cheap others, humans and non-humans. Racial, ethnic and gender hierarchies secure an unpaid or underpaid labor force from which surplus is extracted. Surplus invested to make more surplus. Economic growth, in other words. The role of undervalued care labor, mostly by women, is crucial in my story. I follow in my work Silvia Federici, who showed how separating women from the control of their bodies was as crucial for capital's original accumulation as was the separation of laborers from their commons. And interestingly, Federici was writing precisely for the period uh, that also Malthus uh, started writing at. And while Malthus was at attributing um, excess, uh, the growing numbers of people to overpopulation and helping the poor, Federici has showed how it was actually an attack on the rights of women who up to there um, had their own ways of uh, family planning. It was an attack precisely by, by the forces and interests of incipient capital, which lacked the excess labor force that would make production cheap enough in order to be competitive and to expand. Let me close here by weaving connections between the different uh, parts of my research that I presented here. 
If we want to understand social and environmental injustices in the food chain, for example, like the ones I presented here, or any other commodity chain, from minerals to tree plantations, we have to focus on the systemic force that demands the cheapening of people and their environments. This force has a name, capitalism. And the cause of the cheapening is the inexorable need of capital to grow without limit, 3% per year, all the way to an impossible infinity. Growth in the short term is only possible by shifting costs to racialized others, out of you or to the future. To this impossible goal of compound growth, more and more is sacrificed. Our commons, our public health and education systems that we build with so much effort and pain, the very well-being of our planet and of our descendants. To think of escape routes, we need to start by looking at the actual people fighting to limit capital and to limit growth. Those who struggle to block mines and oil pipelines. Those who work for food sovereignty or peasant agriculture. Those who reclaim the commons of their cities, occupying squares. And we have to think carefully how these disparate fights can be connected into a broader social and political movement that finally brings social, environmental and climate justice. A movement for an environmentalism of the commons. Thank you.